listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Golseth. I'm Andy Bates. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for your support of The Coffee Hour. You can find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. We have another history episode today. We are like knees, ankles, waist deep in history right now. And I am totally here for it. This is so much fun to learn about our LCMS history all of the German immigrants that came over and how they were able to have pastors and churches and all the influential people that came over here and what happened when they're, when they came over and all of the history and drama and stories. This is wonderful. So joining us today, Reverend Dr. Cameron McKenzie, professor of historical theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Thanks so much for joining us again. Well, thank you for having me again. All right. So in our last episode, we left off with the story of Friedrich Winniken and how he came to the United States. But we we barely touched the surface of his story and his connection with Wilhelm Lea. So where do you want to start with, with Winniken and Lea and, and that partnership, how they brought more German pastors to America? Yeah, well, 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 let's talk a little bit about Winniken first and then how then his efforts to communicate back home, and we'll bring Leah into the story then. Wigan was from another part of Germany. He's from Hanover, which is in the northern part. And his father had been a pastor, but his father died when he was still a boy. But nonetheless, the mother and relatives could see to it that uh, Winniken received the kind of education you needed, you know, the prep school, the gymnasium, the university. And so he graduated, I think it was from the University of Holly, might have been getting it. It's one of those two. And he was ready to become a pastor. Now, the system there was different from what it is today. In a certain sense, their vicarage, as we call it in the Missouri Senate, their internship occurred after they were graduates. And they would do something else while waiting for somebody to nominate them for a call or for them to solicit a patron who could put them into a call. And in Winniken's case, uh, he was a private tutor for a couple of years. But during those years, you got a little bit of experience, at least teaching the word, sometimes also preaching it. But you thought also about what you wanted to do with your life. Now, Winniken's family were some of those folks in the old country who were interested in making sure that when Germans moved to other parts of the world, as a lot of them were starting to do, that they would have pastors. And so they were active in a mission society. And so Winnikin had this in the back of his mind. And at one point, having read some of the literature about the need for pastors in America, he decided to volunteer. And so he contacted one of these mission societies. They were willing to commission him, ordain him, send him, and off he came. So by the summer of 1838, now remember, this is you know, roughly a half year before the Saxons. He's in Baltimore. He did kind of the northern route instead of the southern route. So he's in Baltimore uh, and he's looking for a Lutheran church. It takes him a while, but he finally finds one. This is pastored by a man by the name of Hesbert. And so Pastor Hesbert and Wayne can kind of link up. Hesbert doesn't know anything about this young guy. He's a little suspicious. Is he, can he really trust him? Can he really recommend him? But then Hesbert falls ill. Winniken fills in for several weeks. He does a good job. Hesbert says, oh, yeah, this guy is good. We had a, he'd like to keep him in Baltimore, actually. But Winniken says, no, 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 I came here to be a mission, missionary out in the West. So Hesbert sees to it that he links up with an American group that sends missionaries to the West, and they send him out to Ohio and Indiana. It takes a little while to get here, but he's persistent. He finally lands here in northern part, north eastern, eastern part of Indiana. Again, there are some Germans. He has an interesting, there's an interesting story about his first arrival in part of Indiana today that we call Decatur. And Winniken asks, well, are there any Germans around here? Says he's a missionary, any Germans? And he talks to one guy and the guy says, well, yes. He said, now, if you are... Well, he said, there is a man across the street. He's sick and he needs a pastor. But if you're like the other guys who come here, you're going to go over there where there's a, a rich a rich farmer and you'll talk to him. Well, Winnikin 
takes the test and he goes to visit with the, the sick man to pastor this sick man. So Winnikin starts to establish his bona fides as a real missionary. He links up with a fellow who had started a church in Friedheim, Indiana. They had lost their pastor just some months before, so they were really glad that Winnikin could get there. There's a similar group in Fort Wayne, Indiana, pastored by the same guy, so they're also vacant. He comes to Fort Wayne, and they're glad to have him, and they say, won't you be our pastor? And he says, well, yes, I'll be your pastor, but I am still going to be going on these mission trips. And so that's what he does. He plunges right in, and he travels to wherever he gets an inkling that there might be some Germans who want to hear the word of God. And this this part of the country is really quite primitive yet. We don't have any roads or highways. You're either going to be walking along these dirt trails, maybe Indian paths, or you're going to be in a boat or a canoe traveling that way. Uh, but Winnikin throws himself into this. He's now the pastor of two congregations and is bound and determined to find Germans, organize them into churches. Well, it doesn't take him very long to realize that the work is much more than any one man can do. And so he begins to write reports up. First of all, reports for the German Lutherans in the eastern part of America who had helped to send him in the first place. And then also way back to Europe, reports for the basic constituency, which was so important in sending missionaries to other parts of the globe, especially in the United States in those days. And his reports are very readable. In fact, kind of dramatic. And I'm going to read a few parts of it here in just a second. So they get printed up in all kinds of church papers and they influence people. They motivate people. And in time after time, when we talk about the founders of the Missouri Synod, we will discover that many of them were motivated to come by reading Winnikin's material, reading Winnikin's material. August Kramer was one. August Selly was another. While well, Friedrich Lochner heard him, Ernst and Berger, the first couple of missionaries, they, so Winnikin was just a great motivator. Now, I'm not going to read a lot of this because, you know, over the radio, unless you're a pretty good reader, this isn't going to mean a whole lot. But <laughs> there, are, there are some very good narrations. And I wanted to read the first part so you get the idea of kind of the appeal that he's making. Uh, remember, he's a, a German Lutheran writing back to Germany. And he says, Dear brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has redeemed, purchased, and won us with his precious blood and with his spirit, has sanctified us, that we should live as his holy people and possession under him and his kingdom and everlasting innocence, righteousness, and blessedness. A preacher of the church appeals to your hearts and with tears pleads with you, help your brethren who are bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. Yea who through the same precious blood which is shed for them and you through the same spirit by whom you may have been sanctified, through the same baptism, the same holy communion, through the same holy faith, have been united with you in one holy family more intimately than through flesh and blood. Now, it's interesting because he appeals both to flesh and blood. These are Germans. And later on in this piece, he says, just imagine German heathen who could imagine such a terrible thing. But, fundamental to his appeal is that these people have been baptized. They're Christians. They need to have churches. So it's both kind of the, let's say, an ethnic appeal as well as a theological appeal. Now, what's the, what's the big problem? What's the big problem? Well, he talks about the big problem describing the condition of the Germans, both in the large cities, think Baltimore, and then also in the countryside, think Indiana and Ohio. In the cities, he talks about a great many of our fellow Germans are sunk in the mire of baseness. They give rein to their animal drives without any awe for that which is holy, no longer restrained even outwardly by any discipline. Even now, as I write this, horror and dismay still fill me as I remember the shamelessness with which vice 
strutted about in the streets of a seaport, not hidden in the darkness of night, but in the broadest daylight, and how there I found the grossest indecency as well as the most abominable dens of vice owed by Germans. Then he goes on, talks about it in more detail. And then he gets to the countryside. And here he says one of the big problems. Well, it's not only in the countryside, it's in the city too. And that is the lack of preachers opens the congregation's door and gate to all kinds of deceivers who blabber and play the hypocrite. And he talks about them. He says, they are hired like cowherds and are frequently the most abominable fellows or clever frauds. In Wheeling, West Virginia today, yeah. this writer unmasked a child molester who had been expelled from one of the most respected teacher seminaries in Germany because of this very vice. Here, under the mask of the most holy piety, he had forced himself in as a pastor. So, disrespect, disreputable people who just go out West and they can pretend that they're pastors if they know a little theology, know how to gab and so forth, and they get away with it. And then he has another great example of a guy who was a barrel maker. And he talks about this barrel maker with his wife and little child driving up to an inn in a little village in the frontier in a small wagon such as traveling missionaries in the West are accustomed to have. And then he describes how he's mistaken for a pastor. And when the German asks him, well, are you a preacher? It occurs to the wheel maker, barrel maker, I'm sorry, the barrel maker, uh, that in the West, preaching might be a better trade than barrel making. So he says, yes, he's a preacher. Well, Divine services are announced. The house is filled. The people haven't heard a preacher in many years. And the cooper talks well. They immediately hire him as a preacher and a home is furnished him. For six weeks, he preaches to his own and his congregation's satisfaction. Then rumors are spread about, about he is mistreating his wife and his children. Well, these rumors proved to be factual. And so they end up kicking him out of the city. The young men of the city, or the town, I should say, they stick a rail between his legs, lift him up on their shoulders, carry him with great jubilation through the city, and then run him out of town in disgrace. All right, that's the situation. Winnikin arrives, and they're not too eager to have another pastor. Well, he kind of scolds them, and I think you'll get a kick out of this. When I scolded the people, for exact, accepting anyone who came to them as a preacher without asking for credentials, they answered, well, he had a tremendous gift of gab. We had to have a preacher and he was cheap too. So, <laughs> I'm surprised Hollywood hasn't picked this up yet. <laughs> know, right? What a script. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. So that's the kind of stuff that Winnegan is writing back. And people are eating this up and they are saying, man, we've got to do something about this. And at least one of them, actually more than one of them did. And that was Wilhelm Leia. So if you don't mind, I will bring Leia into the story. Well, let's do that in just a moment. We'll, okay. we'll take a quick break sure. and we'll continue our conversation, taking a look at Wilhelm Leia in just a moment as we learn more about the history of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod with Reverend Dr. Cameron McKenzie. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Dun, 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 dun. 
Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Eggleseth. We are learning about the history of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod with the Reverend Dr. Cameron McKenzie. We're right in the middle of a good story, so I'm just going <laughs> to hand it back to you as we learn more about Wilhelm Lea today. What, what would you like for us to learn about Wilhelm Lea, Dr. McKenzie? Well, Wilhelm Lea was just a parish pastor, <laughs> but he was quite a parish pastor. Lea is a pastor in Franconia. He was a graduate, I believe it was the University of Erlangen. He had actually been led to a sincere Lutheran confessional faith, actually by, by a Reformed teacher there who encouraged him to take his, his church and its, its uh, confession seriously. He had a lot of talents and a lot of skills, but the position that he could find initially was that of being pastor in this small rural parish of Neuen Dettelsau in Bavaria. It's not too far out of Nuremberg, but far enough to be in a position all by itself. And really, he really didn't want to be there. And he, well, for a long time, he hoped he could leave, but he didn't. This is where God wanted him. And so he made a ministry out of it. I think we talked in a previous episode about what was going on in Germany and how Things like the rationalism and the unionism had sparked a confessional revival, a, a renewal of interest, at least by some, in what it meant to be a Lutheran, according to uh, Luther, the confessions and the like. Well, Leah was one of those. Leah was one of those. So he's very interested in real Lutheranism. And so when he gets the work, he, he reads some of Winnikin's stuff and he reprints it in a church paper that he published along with others. And he gets a response. And they should kind of talk about that a little bit. So he puts Winnikin's material into his papers. And Winnikin has help us do something for us. Well, people started to send in money to Leah in response to the appeal. <laughs> so he, you know, he hadn't really planned what, what are we going to do with this money? Are we going to send it to a mission society? What are we going to do? And he talks it over with fellow pastors. And well, shortly thereafter, the answer arrived at his front door. It was a layman. His name was Adam Ernst. He was a tailor. You know, he made people's clothes. Uh, but he had been moved by this appeal to do as the hymn says, here I am, send me, send me. And so, you know, Leia, well, well, I guess we'll send you. So what Leia decided to do, along with a, a neighboring pastor, is that they would train this guy for frontier ministry. I mean, he, he doesn't have any university education. He had, a good, he had a good catechism education. He knew his Lutheran doctrine, but not much more. But he had good character, good, good reputation. So Leah decided to train him and send him. And his first thought was to send him as a teacher, somebody who could assist the pastor in instructing particularly the young or converts and so forth. So that was the original plan. And it wasn't too long after he had started on Ernst that another guy uh, turned up, a George Berger. And he was, now I might have this confused. Could be that Ernst was a cobbler and Berger was a tailor, or it might be the other way around. I don't remember. <laughs> At any rate, neither one of them had any theological training. They were both dedicated laymen. And so what, uh, Leia did was to train them as best he could in everything they needed to know. And that meant not only doctrine and Bible and church history, it also meant handwriting in English. So they really just did the whole gamut of stuff for these guys over a period of months, not a period of years. It was really kind of a accelerated program. And then when at last he thought they were ready, he wrote up instructions for them and sent them off to America. So Berger and Ernst were the first two of Leia's emergency helpers, or sometimes called the Zendlingas, the sent ones, headed for the American frontier, headed for Winniken and others on that frontier to help with that mission. When they got here, both Ernst and Berger quickly realized that whatever the status of pastors back in the old world was in the new world on the frontier, they knew as much or more than anybody else. And what was needed 
was not pastoral assistants, but actual pastors. So they got permission from Leah to accept calls as pastors on the frontier. Terrence was called to Ohio. I think there's a Marysville, Ohio. And Berger actually became a pastor of one of the Winnikin Foundations just over the border in Ohio. So both men quickly kind of were transformed into pastors. And Leah realized that the program that he had begun in Franconia would end up training pastors for frontier ministry. Over about the next decade, uh, Leah and his associates uh, trained over 80 uh, men for the frontier ministry. And uh, the bulk of those 80 ended up becoming pastors in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. So when the Synod is founded, and in the decade and the years following, uh, it's many more pastors from the Leah Winnikin group who populate the congregations of the Missouri Synod would be true of the Saxons, just because there are a whole lot more of them. So, but, so they're a very important part of this, of this story. But we're not done with Leah yet by any means. <laughs> uh, because he, he's, he's got this, well, one of the things we need to mention about him, and I'm going to get my notes here again for you on this one, is that he is concerned that the, yeah, that the mission be Lutheran, not just kind of generic Christian, but Lutheran. And so he wrote up instructions for every one of his, every one of his missionaries that said things like this. I'm going to read a little bit of it. You are seeking the office of the servant of the German Lutheran Church. You embrace with deep devotions the confessions and doctrine of the Lutheran Church. A German Lutheran candidate for the ministry seeks office with a church of his confession. Therefore, for conscience sake, you cannot accept a mixed congregation. Now, what's a mixed congregation? Well, I think we'll talk about this probably next time a little bit more. And that is, this is Lutherans and Reformed German Protestants in one congregation, kind of those unionistic stuff that we're talking about in Germany. Well, it happened on the frontier as well. And he said, you can't go that route. He said, you have to join a, you have to serve a Lutheran congregation. In addition to that, he specified that you would use hymnals and agenda that are uh, Lutheran and that you will uh, carry out your ministry uh, in conjunction with other Lutherans. So he specified that you will find, I get, should get the exact language here, yes. When a congregation has properly called you, seek examination and ordination by a German Lutheran synod. And if possible, permit yourself to be ordained before the eyes and ears of your congregation. So Winnikin, not Winnikin, Leah was concerned that they send missionaries committed to authentic Lutheranism Bible and confessions, and that's the way they teach, preach, and practice when they get to the American frontier. Now, I don't know how we're doing for time. Are we okay? got a few more minutes? We've got like two minutes left. <laughs> okay, well, that's fine. Because in these instructions, he does uh, something else, which turns out to be significant. And that is, he tells them to report back on what is being done for the American Indians, the natives on the frontier with whom their pastors and their congregations would be having contact. And from those reports, Leah decided that they ought to send not just missionaries to the Germans, but they ought to send missionaries to the Indians as well. And so Leah sets about to do this. He solicits money. He solicits volunteers. And he finally recruits a pastor for this American Indian mission. And the, mon the man that he does is, and I, I should have told you this before, Sarah, it's confusing to me as to whether it's August Friedrich or Friedrich August Kramer. <laughs> um, the stuff I've read has both. So, both. <laughs> but at any rate, he finds a young man who is willing to go 
he's willing to go at least in part because he too has been inspired by Winniken to volunteer for the American mission. Moreover, he has a very interesting past. Maybe I can sketch it here in the last few seconds of our period here. But he had begun uh, kind of adult life as a student revolutionary in the post Napoleonic era, was ready to overthrow the government, didn't work. He was thrown into prison, spent a few years in prison. The prison experience helped to make him a better Christian. <sighs> when he got out of prison, what was he going to do? Well, he finished his university and then went to England because one of the areas of his expertise was the English language. And he learned it better and went to America, went to Oxford where he was studied, but also tutored. He actually didn't like Oxford. The Oxford movement was going on. It was kind of a liturgical renewal. He thought that was too Catholic. So anyway, he comes back and he links up with Leah and Leah says, you're the man I want to send to America. Leah's secretary, Lawrence Wazel, was so inspired by this project. He not only helped to organize it, he himself went to America. And it was in the uh, summer of 1845 uh, that these guys started their voyage across the Atlantic. Uh, that too was very adventurous. Uh, they hit a sandbar. A sand, they were on a sandbar initially. They ran into an iceberg. Smallpox broke out on the ship uh, before they finally landed in uh, in New York. Now, there's more to that story, but I'm not sure we've got time to finish it. So why don't we make that our cliffhanger and we'll pick it up when we get back. Yes, this is a great story. And this is this is a teeny part of this history that I've researched also because Kramer is somebody, his wife shows up in one of our Ladies' Lounge podcasts. So Marthea yeah. Kramer has her own episode on the Ladies' Lounge. So that that's a little su uh, subsection of this history. So fantastic story. We will pick that up next time. Dr. McKenzie, thank you so much for joining us today on The Coffee Hour. You're very welcome. Glad to do it. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Golseth. I'm Andy Bates. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.